seems I usually in this group have a tendency to talk, talk about mindfulness, sometimes uh, loving kindness. Seems like uh, this is a, a good venue to have, have an experience. And we have such a, a special place here. It's, it's very quiet and it's all set up for us. It's, it's kind of a, a very special zone where we can come in and have a, a particular kind of experience if we, uh, if we apply ourselves to it a little bit. And it seems it seems to me that all the uh, all of the words and the talking and so on that I might say there's nothing nothing I can say would really match up to an actual experience of what it's like to be mindful and to, to, to meditate a little bit perhaps practice some loving kindness meditation but the actual experience of these teachings is much more powerful than any words and They're evidence of, of, of a reality that can never be conveyed through speech. Such contrast, I think, to the kinds of experience we normally have. Kind of a reset, you know, and a relief. going through the guided meditation, I said, you know, this awareness of the breath, imagining the heart there in our chest and being aware of the body. It's, a, it's an opportunity for us to develop this quality of awareness and also to, to learn something. As I was talking a little bit in the, in the break there about this kind of thing, and bring our awareness to, to the body and suddenly the body starts changing in relation to this. The experience can be quite powerful when we actually kind of uh, intentionally bring our awareness in this way, in a methodical way to our bodies. Of course, we know there's a, a very intimate connection between the, the mind and the body. We, we start having some kind of a physical sensation and the mind starts thinking and emotions start arising. Or perhaps we start thinking about something and emotions start arising and we start feeling the effects on the body. This is quite normal. But it often happens to us in a way that's quite uncontrolled. It's out of our control. The, the heart is initiating thoughts. It's initiating emotions on its own without consulting us. Or the body starts having sensations and feelings without, without ever asking us. And then we're beset by these things. <laughs> and we see through a practice like we've just done that if we can activate some mindfulness, if we can bring awareness to bear in the present moment, that this this can, can have a strong influence over all of this stuff as well. And uh, even if it's difficult, if we're new to the practice, or if the mind is especially stirred up when we sit down to meditate, hopefully we find, I think many of us find, maybe most of us find, that after a meditation session, we feel calmer, we feel kind of more aware, clearer inside. And if we note that after a meditation, no matter how hard it might have been to do the meditation, we, we might think that well, this, is, this is actually really good. This is actually a good thing. Kind of like if we go to the gym, you know, and we we work out, our doctor told us we should work out, like they tell us now we should meditate too. <laughs> so you know you should go and get some exercise. And so you go to the gym and boy, the first time you do it, it seems really difficult <laughs> if you haven't exercised before, if you're really out of shape, you know. 
even after a short uh, short uh, exercise session, you may even feel quite quite painful. You wake up the next morning, you feel, wow, I'm I'm really uh, I'm really feel quite uncomfortable now. <laughs> but you, you you feel like it's probably good for you, so you keep it up, and then over time it becomes easier and becomes a part of your life, and you you find that it, it feels quite good. And if you were to stop, it sometimes happen happens. And over time, you, find, you start feeling worse again. People often find the same with meditation. So if we can try to bring to bear that, that quality right now, even while listening, says in the, the scriptures we have that the um, that one should listen to the teachings with all all of their mind and you listen, listen with your whole mind with attention and Ajahn Chah would tell his disciples you know listen to these teachings with your heart not with your ears <laughs> trying to have an attitude of receptivity so that the heart can understand. Because after all, it's the heart that is the one that initiates emotions and thoughts. And so it's such an important part of us. Buddha said that there is one contemplation, one set of contemplations, that all people should do frequently. While well, he gave us many meditation styles, there's one set of contemplations, he said, that everyone should do frequently. And that's come down to us to the present day as the five subjects for frequent recollection. The first subject is that I am subject to aging. I have not gone beyond getting old. I am subject to aging. I have not gone beyond getting old. The second is that I am subject to illness. I have not gone beyond getting sick. And the third is that I am subject to dying. I have not gone beyond death. The fourth is that everything that is dear and pleasing to me will become otherwise and will be separated from me. This can also be translated as, I will change and become separated from all that I hold dear. And then the fifth contemplation is that I am the owner of my actions and live dependent on my actions. Whatever actions I do, whether they are good or bad, of those I will be the heir.
No, the, the first four are about realities of life that we can all see in the present. We all know that we are subject to old age, disease, and death. And that eventually, everything we hold dear, we must become separated from. And the Buddha emphasized throughout his teaching career that, the, that our intentional actions are our supports in this life. That they are the, the positive influence we have in relation to the suffering in life. And he emphasized in his teachings on kama, what is uh, oftentimes also said as karma, or intentional action, that we can see the cause and effect relationships right here in the present as well. He would point out to his disciples that you know, if you steal, you're much more likely to, to go to jail. <laughs> it's quite straightforward. And he emphasized this to his disciples. You know. And for those who were unsure if there was a future life or not, he would say, well, if there are consequences of good and bad actions, and, and there is a future life, then not only are you protected here in this life, if you live in a moral way, but then you will be protected in the next life as well, and so you're covered both ways. One form of good karma is the mental activity of developing right view. These five recollections are aspects of right view that can be seen right here in the here and now. And I believe this is why the Buddha recommended reflecting on these five recollections frequently. The gist of the, the suttas is that that is the scriptures, is that we shouldn't believe things blindly. In fact, there is a, there's a teaching in the Ajahn Chah lineage that at one time the Buddha was giving a teaching to a group of, of disciples and, and one of his chief disciples, the Venerable Sariputta, known to the tradition as, as the disciple foremost in wisdom, was there with him. And after giving the teaching, he turned to, to Sariputta and, and said, you know, Sariputta, do you believe this teaching? And Sariputta, one of the Buddha's chief disciples, turned to the Buddha and responded, I have to say that, that I don't, because I haven't had a chance to practice with it yet. And so the Buddhist path is fundamentally a path of inquiry, of testing to see what works and what doesn't work, countering delusion, one of the three fundamental defilements of the mind, with awareness and discernment in the present to notice the cause and effect relationships playing out in our life. Now, just as the first rays on the horizon foretell dawn, say the scriptures, right view is the forerunner of all skillful mental states, that is, all skillful qualities of the heart, which in turn lead to skillful actions in body, speech, and mind, 
and pleasant consequences for us. And so the Buddha said, one of the most fundamentally important forms of good karma we can do is to develop this right view. And these five recollections are five aspects of right view that we can see right here in our own lives in the present. We don't have to take anyone else's word for it. And as we contemplate them frequently, they sink down into the heart. The heart becomes acquainted with them. And slowly its priorities in life become more clear. What really is wise to do? What is important? Considering that all of our acquisitions will change and be separated from us, how much should we invest ourselves in our acquisitions? Considering that youth is ephemeral, how much should we be infatuated with youth? Considering that the body will die, how attached should we be to our bodies? And how do we want to act? And what kind of course do we want to plot through life? So that later in life, when we're experiencing old age, disease, and death, that we'll, we'll be happy with what we've done in our lives. And we'll have the spiritual supports to navigate through these difficulties. Last time I spoke at this at this group, I was I, I had touched upon one area of infatuation in, in in our culture. I think in American culture, the infatuation with information, and I juxtaposed it with knowing. Information versus knowing, so two very different things. There are other fundamental infatuations, obsessions that living beings have, driving them through their day, through their activities, their priority in life that seems so important that they don't even question it. And so much of their, their identity is bound up with it. You see it in the, in the culture, kind of overtaking the culture. It's, if we think about what the priorities of the culture are, what we see on the billboards, on the screens, the plans people make through their lives, the most fundamentally important things that they think they need to have. And then see how as we, we, as people, even if they are able to get these things that seem so important to them, 
So engage in these activities, engage in these relationships. How they're not satisfied. Very shortly afterward, they're, they're simply agitated again, wanting something or pressed by life into doing something and start off on, on the hamster wheel again, rushing and rushing and rushing on the hamster wheel of life. Sometimes before they've even had a chance to really enjoy what, what it is they've finally gotten that they've tried so hard to get, they're already thinking about what they have to do next. So many, so many of us. Do. And um, even finding that these, these obsessions don't go away, but instead they actually get stronger. So we see, you know, in, in uh, we see in society things like, you know, people engage in romantic relationships, and develop develop romantic relationships, and then are tempted into infidelity. Ajahn Chah once said, "Boy, if you, you know, you can't." It's, it's, it's so hard to be satiated, he said, you know, if you, if you have, a, uh, if you have a, a partner, a spouse, you know, you can, you still, still will never be satisfied. It's kind of a paraphrase. And, uh, with food, we start eating food and we get into it and, and we can develop a more and more refined taste around food and we want certain kinds of foods and we develop a taste for cooking and, and, and more and more elaborations and specific, specificity and then so easily dissatisfied with the foods that we have. And if we're mindful, if we pay attention, we can notice that there's actually a, in the heart an intimate link between, between greed and aversion actually. As we feed our cravings for things, the dissatisfaction and aversion in our life also grows. So I remember a scene from a movie was quite uh, quite famous at the time it came out, but I don't know if people still know about it. It's called Groundhog Day, and it's, it's a, a character in the movie in the early stages of the movie. He's, so having such a hard time finding satisfaction and happiness in life, he sits down at a table in a restaurant and he orders one of every dessert. And so they have the entire table that's got desserts on it. You can't even see the table. It's got, it's got desserts spread out all across, all around the table. And so there shows him eating one after the other, you know, and he's shoving a whole eclair into his mouth. <laughs> For example, or a donut or something like this. All this frosting on it and goop and stuff. And he's got goop on his lips. And, so he stuffs himself on desserts, and but you can see there he is, he's stuffed and bloated, sitting at the table with all these, you know, plates in front of him, and he looks even less happy than he did when he sat down. <laughs> this is this is a consequence of of trying to, of indulging our, our 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 greed for sensual pleasures. Greed for sensual pleasures and aversion and unhappiness are actually intimately linked. You would never guess it, you know, the mind clouded by delusion, unaware, initiates greed. And then the object of the greed seems so alluring but actually it's simply a mirage, it's simply an illusion. It's something we, the mind casts out upon, it's a perception that the mind overlays on, on the sense object, the object of our desire. The object itself is neither, you know, actually attractive or repulsive, it's just what it is. You see this, we have so many flavors of ice cream, one person likes a certain flavor of ice cream, the other person doesn't like it. 
it's not about the ice cream itself, it's about the, uh, the heart of the person who's perceiving the object. It's a trick of perception. This happens on a very fundamental level in all of our perceptions, that we're actually perceiving a kind of illusion of the world. The heart in relation to sensory experience initiates the processes of perception, which is trying to recognize what the object is and display it for us, render it for us. Display is a word for, for visual sense object, something to see. It does the same for sounds and for all other sense objects, the sensations we feel in our bodies and so on. Memories, even, are a kind of illusion. The perceptual process influenced by so many things and we feel sure we have a memory of something so clear, and then we, you know, we could be talking about somebody, you know, you were wearing the red dress, and you were with Bob. You break out the photo album, and you see, you know, they were wearing, a, you were wearing actually a yellow dress, and Bob wasn't even there. interesting process if you very mindfully listen here the song in the distance another example of this you know and you can't quite place it what is that song you know, trying to place it and if you can recognize it then suddenly it clicks and suddenly every note seems so clear and it's boy why didn't I recognize that to start with right the process of perception, filling in the details. When we see a man or a woman, the heart fills in the masculine properties if the heart thinks it's a man, fills in the feminine properties if the heart thinks it's a woman. And then these these perceptions are influenced by our, our likes and our dislikes with regard to, to the person that we're perceiving, or with regard to men, or with regard to women, for example, and so on like this. If you go, if you meditate and you develop, uh, develop some insight into the processes the mind is going through, the, the heart can actually take control of this process and, and transpose them to experiment and learn about it. Perceiving men as women, for example, and women as men. And so women take on what the perceiver, the meditator, would consider to be a masculine appearance. And the women take on, and the, and the um, did I say that right? Women take on a masculine appearance and men take on a feminine appearance. And the heart sees from this, actually. My perceptions of these people, what they look like to me, were actually so heavily influenced by my own perceptual processes. And so the heart learns that the, the visual objects it learns about the visual objects and it learns about the processes of mind. It learns that all of these things are very impermanent and uncertain and they're not ultimately satisfying. They're all very ephemeral and, and so on like this. And in the process of perception, for example, how we see things we usually so strongly identify with are actually not self. Throughout our lives, they've been the, 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 percep the perceptual processes have been acting on their own, creating an illusion that we got so caught up in. None of it was real, and none of it was really me or mine. And the heart begins to let go, and letting go, and letting go, and experiencing greater and greater levels of ease and, and pleasure in the heart.
And then we think back to something like the, the five recollections. Old age, disease and death, separation from all that we hold dear. That helps us bring life more into perspective over time. It helps us to develop the right priorities. And thinking about, you know, my actions have consequences. When I chase after sensual pleasures, I experience some pleasure sometimes, so much, and then what follows on that. And when I do, when I practice things like generosity or meditation, like the breath meditation or loving kindness meditation, I have another kind of experience. And what kind of an effect that has. We become much more clear about our choices in life. As we develop our mindfulness, we start noticing this on a on a on a on a finer level more and more frequently the choices we make throughout the day as we experience different sense objects and different emotions and activate mindfulness and try to be careful about you know, what's really skillful to do. If I really want something, well, is it really wise to follow that want? If I use my mindfulness, can I be calm? make a clearer decision. If I'm upset, if I'm angry, if I'm anxious, if I'm scared, can I use my mental skills, a kind of meditation, and be calmer and make a skillful choice about what to do? Can I unwind kind of the repetitive obsessions and habits and tendencies in my life? And live a happier life. I'd like to share my merit with you. Speaking of kama or karma, we have in the traditions of Buddhism the teaching that the goodness in the heart that arises from good actions can be shared with others. An experience is a, is a pleasant feeling in the heart. It can be experienced as rapture or power or peace in the heart when shared. So I share some merit with all of you. I shall close the talk here now. Now would be a time for another short break. I myself actually use a brief break.